Welcome to the LND Go Beyond podcast. This is the show that brings you real, actionable workplace learning insights from some of the brightest minds in the LND space. This season, we're diving into the realm of learning impact. Join experts as they share their knowledge and experiences, helping us push the boundaries of what's possible when it comes to delivering impactful learning. Get ready to go beyond. Enjoy the conversation. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this fresh episode of season two of the LND Go Beyond podcast. Like always, we bring you top experts to gain insights which can help all of us go beyond. And in this season, our focus has exclusively been on learning impact. So today we have someone who's all about impact via learning and learning transfer measurement, Will Halheimer. Welcome, Will. Uh, thanks, Amit. Good to be here. Fantastic. Let me take a moment to introduce you, Will, to our audience, though I know almost everybody would know you. Uh, but for very few of those who may not have come across your work yet, Will Thalheimer, consultant, speaker, author, and researcher at the Work Learning Research, is a world-renowned thought leader focused on research-based practices for learning work performance, presentations, and evaluation. He wrote the award-winning book, Performance Focused Learner Surveys. That's right here with me. And the soon-to-be released CEO's Guide to Training, E-Learning, and Work, Empowering Learning for Competitive Advantage. Will has created LTEM, the Learning Transfer Evaluation Model, and conducts popular workshops like the LTEM Bootcamp. He's also co-created the Learning Development Accelerator and the e-learning manifesto. Well, I'm so glad that you could join us today. Thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me, Amit. Fantastic. So, Will, I want to talk to you about you know, all about learning evaluation, uh, measurement, uh, and your unique approach to designing learning surveys. But before that, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, uh, what are you doing now? What informs your current work? Sure. I've, I've been in the learning and development field for uh, over 30 years. And um, I played a number of different roles along the years. I've been an instructional designer. I've been a trainer. I was the leadership development trainer. Uh, I once had a job with my title was simulation architect, so building simulations. Um, I built e-learning. I was a project manager, product manager, uh, product line manager. Uh, played a number of different roles. I've been a consultant on my own um, at Work Learning Research for over 23 years. I've worked for a couple other companies along the way, the Strategic Management Group and Tier 1 Performance. Um, and I focused a lot on research-based practices. And basically, uh, early on, I helped companies build more effective learning interventions by looking at the research, research benchmarking, um, et cetera. Along the way, I got interested in learning evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that some of what we were doing was sort of not aligned with the research on human learning. I got curious, uh, studied it a bit, did some research on it, and uh, uh, that led to, you know, stuff that you mentioned like uh, the LTAM, the Learning Transfer Evaluation Model, and the book as well. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, a, a little anecdote here, you know, uh, a few years ago, uh, one of the school teachers in my daughter's school was kind of talking about learning styles and how they incorporate that in their uh, curriculum design, et cetera. And I had to point them to your uh, debunker club links. And <laughs> you know that's, that's really when I st really started following your work about maybe five, six years ago. So I was very impressed with what you had done with the debunker club. So thank you for that. Uh, yeah, so um, for, for those who don't know, the Debunker Club uh, was just a way to get people to be sensitive to some of the myths in the learning field. Um, I've always felt like, you know, the, the folks in medicine have a good idea, first do no harm. And so sometimes we get caught up with these, you know, uh, these, these ideas that sound good, 
Mm. But if you look more deeply at them, if you look at the research, then they don't really stand up. Uh, learning styles is one one of those myths. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. I appreciate that. Of course, you know, we, we not only have to overcome myths, we have to then turn around and say, okay, what can we do? What is the what does the research tell us that works? What do, what do we learn from our learning evaluations that help us develop uh, more effective learning? Okay, so well, when we talk about learning evaluation, uh, creating results, measuring impact, you know, what's the big picture here? How should we be thinking about it? Um, well, the first thing is to know that it's really uh, complex work. You know, learning is complex on its own. Human learning, human beings are, you know, infinitely, uh, you know, complicated. Uh, when we put learning measurement on top of learning, uh, then it becomes even more complex. So first thing we ought to know, hey, we're not aiming for perfection. Um, we're just trying to get reasonable proxies for the constructs we want to measure. Uh, the other big picture thing is, uh, and, and I talk about this in, in the workshops that I do in conference presentations, um, that there's really three reasons that we might want to measure learning. One is to demonstrate the value. Uh, two is to support our learners in learning. And three is to improve the learning and to keep what's good. Um, uh, to me, the, the foundational one is that third one. Uh, if we improve our learning, if we're making sure it's effective, then we're going to be better able to support our learners. We're going to create more value, so then it will be easier to find value as well. But all three of those are important, depending on the situation, your political context, uh, your goals, et cetera. Um, so demonstrate the value, support learners in learning, and improving learning. The last one, improving learning, you know, is, is almost like a constant loop that you are going in. You know, constantly evaluating and improving that as a as a cycle it's kind of you know feeding back into the your process absolutely i i like to talk about a virtuous cycle of continuous improvement mm. um you know as as professionals we should be doing that right we yeah. we, we we should uh build our learning best on based on um, all the wisdom that we have and then we should put it out there and we should see what works and what doesn't and then make improvements if we're not doing that then we're not we're obviously not as effective as we might be. And that's quite the opposite of the virtuous cycle of, you know, going down in terms of not measuring the right things, not getting, uh, not being able to show anything good, hence not getting funding, hence kind of, you know, you kind of spiraling down instead of improving. Yeah, that's true. Uh... Interesting. All right. So, uh, we'll, Tell us more about the LTEM, the Learning Transfer Evaluation Model. You know, most organizations know about Kirkpatrick. It's kind of uh, widespread. Uh, not sure that people use it correctly, and there may be some inherent flaws with that. But how is LTEM better? What does it really offer? So um, LTEM was published first in 2018. And uh, even before it got to that state, um, um, I iterated it 11 times before it was first published. Okay. And I, I got, you know, feedback from uh, experts in learning like uh, Julie Dirksen and Clark Quinn and experts in evaluation like Rob Brinkerhoff, Ingrid Guerra Lopez, and, and a lot of really smart learning and development practitioners. And, and, and I will tell you a funny story. So at one point I had a 15 level model of learning evaluation and they all said, no, Will, don't do that. So uh, LTEM has eight tiers and I call them tiers just so we don't confuse it with the levels of the, of the Kirkpatrick uh, Kitzel model. And by the way, you might hear me call the four level model, the Kirkpatrick Kitzel model, because it turns out that Raymond Kitzel was actually the person that came up with the four level idea Right. Uh, and then Donald Kirkpatrick uh, uh, put labels on that and popularized it. So I feel like both gentlemen deserve credit. Um, so this model, the, the Kirkpatrick itself model, has some really important strengths. Um, it tells us, for example, that uh, learner surveys um, are uh, okay to do, but they're sort of at a low priority. You'll notice it's at level one. Um, another important message that the uh, four-level model sends is that, hey, don't just focus on learning, also focus on work behavior 
-hmm. and uh, results as well. And those are very important messages. But it, it has a few weaknesses that um, we sometimes don't think about. So one is, and, and I believe a model should not only send good messages, nudge us toward good actions and good thinking, but also nudge us away from actions that aren't as helpful. So uh, one thing the, the four-level model is silent on is uh, measuring attendance and measuring participation. And those things are fine to do from a formative evaluation standpoint, so to learn about how people are using our learning. Um, but they're not good enough to validate our learning. We don't want to say, hey, we were wildly successful because we trained 10,000 people. Well, okay, you trained them, but did they learn anything? Or did they learn the wrong things? So those aren't good enough. A model should you know, sort of nudge us away from those. Um, and in LTEM, that's tier one and uh, tier two are attendance, tier one. And two is learner participation or activity. So... Um, uh, not good enough. Uh, so the other thing LTEM does, and what I think, um, uh, uh, well, another another uh, problem, if you will, with the four-level model is that learning is all in one bucket, right? Level two learning. So what what might we measure there? Well, we could re measure the regurgitation of trivia. We could measure the recognition of meaningless information, the recall of meaningless information, or the recognition and uh, recall of meaningful information, but also decision-making competence, also task competence, also skills. So that's a big, long uh, continuum from trivia to skills, right? We put it all in one bucket, we tend to, uh, we tend to ignore some of the more important measures of learning. So what we'll do is we'll say, hey, we need a level two learning measurement. Oh yeah, let's do a knowledge check. Mm -hmm. Well, we know knowledge is typically not good enough to assess whether people are gonna be able to perform on the job. Um, so uh, that's an issue. So what LTEM does is it separates learning into uh, knowledge, decision-making competence, and task competence. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, it gets us thinking about the learning factors that really enable our success as learning practitioners. Um, it also has tier seven is uh, transfer to work behavior and tier eight is uh, the effects of transfer. So the organizational results, the effects on the learners, uh, you can even, uh, LTEM hints at other stakeholders we might wanna think about as well, coworkers, family, friends, community, society, the environments. Not that we have to measure those things or measure about those, but we ought to at least consider, oh, maybe we could. So in a nutshell, um, what LTEM does, I think, and what people have told me is it really brings learning wisdom into the learning evaluation process. In fact, um, a lot of people are finding that it not only improves learning evaluation, but it also helps teams, learning teams, improve their learning designs. Mm -hmm. They get thinking about it and they go, whoa, you know, we're gonna be measuring ourselves based on decision-making competence oh, we ought to give our learners more practice making decisions. And of course, that's aligned with the research on learning that says, hey, realistic practice is really important. Uh, so a lot of people are finding that. It was even found in a doctoral dissertation where um, Dr. El Hammurabi did her dissertation and uh, introduced LTEM to a learning team. And she had two hypotheses. One is that the learning team would be um, inspired to use better learning evaluation methods that's sort of obvious. But the second hypothesis was the interesting one, that they would be inspired to use better learning design. And that's what exactly what she found when she uh, did her research. Hmm. I mean, that kind of, you know, seems a little obvious if you think about it, that if you have to achieve a certain target, you will probably look at better tools and methods. But if, like you mentioned, if level two in the four level model combines all types of learning into one, you probably take the easier one and, and settle for that. We, yeah, we humans uh, have a tendency to be lazy, which is understandable. Yeah, yeah. But to be to be fair to the model, in a way, you know, and I've heard this uh, from a few people. I think uh, Guy Wallace in season one, when he came on the podcast, he was talking about this, that most people end up using the four level model wrongly because they start from the bottom instead of that if they were to start from the top they would probably see all of these problems but yes the challenge is that the model probably through its 
practice has become that you start at the bottom and you kind of miss those important aspects? Well, yeah, but so imagine somebody using the four level model and they think, okay, what are what are the business results we want? Okay, good. What are the behavior results we want? Okay, good. What are the learning results we want? Well, uh, if it's all in one bucket, you might not think about decision-making competence or task competence. Um, uh, so uh, I, I don't think it's I don't <laughs> I don't think it solves the issue. And by the way, there's more than more than one way to use a model. Um, you know, uh, I teach uh, this workshop called the L10 Bootcamp, and in there we talk about like ten different ways to use the learning evaluation model, or really any evaluation model. One is to do sort of a gap analysis. Well, what are we doing now? And you look on the model and you say, okay, what could we be doing? All right, so that that's a, one way to use it. You can use it in co uh, in conversations with your learning team to think about what you're trying to accomplish. You can think about having conversations with your sponsors or customers. Um, hey, uh, here's the model we use to measure. What results do you want? Um, there's uh, LTAM helps frame what we're doing when we're doing evaluation. Sometimes you get involved in a learning evaluation projects is very complex and you sort of lose your way. Well, having a model like LTAM helps you think about, oh, these are sort of the, the benchmarks we're looking at. Helps you just keep it all organized in your head. So lots of ways to use a model. Um, also, you can do what Guy suggested, start from the end and work backwards. Uh, but again, I think that's just one way to use a model. I, I see a bit of a parallel between then LTEM and what you've done with the surveys thing. And we'll come to that. If, because what you're saying is, uh, because of those distinct uh, levels of learning or types, one, you can't miss it. So it's explicit enough. And you can't really say, you know, I may have chosen one, but I can't tell you which one. Uh, and so that's one that it is making like for the learners, you know, survey options should be uh, as distinct uh, as it could be. And the second, it is also kind of feeding forward the design process, because once you see that and you start thinking about it, OK, these are the things maybe we can go for and hence. So it's kind of that stealth messaging that you have in surveys is probably coming through L10 as well. Uh, Amit, that is a very good insight. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, what we're doing, and, and I come, my background's in uh, cognitive science, cognitive psychology, um, and, you know, when we think about getting people's head focused on the right things, uh, we all need help. The world is complex out there, right? And so when we have some guideposts, things to think about, then we're much more likely to think about the important things. Um, and that's what we try to do with LTEM, getting people to think, oh, it's not just about knowledge, it's also about decision-making and task competence. Um, and when we talk about surveys, we want the learners to understand, hey, these are the things that make learning effective, and these are the things you should be thinking about when you are evaluating, when you're thinking about answering our survey questions. So, um, yeah, it's all about, uh, you know, sort of nudging people to think appropriately and uh, presciently about the, the content we're asking them about. Excellent, excellent. And we'll, we'll go a little deeper into the survey and uh, other things. Uh, in fact, let's let's you know start talking about the book itself. I, I read that book, the performance-focused learner surveys, uh, last year, and I found it immensely insightful. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and and quite practical. You know, so at the same time, so the, the the good thing is it gives you a lot of new things to think about and possibly changes your perspective. And at the same time, it makes it easier for you to go ahead and implement. And I'm saying easier. Uh, I felt it is a sort of low hanging fruit to for the L&D teams that they can probably adopt and start making more or better impact in their organization. So I'm hoping you can share some insights on that, just how to do that. Sure. Uh, for, for those who aren't, aren't familiar, let me say a little bit about the methodology. So, uh, and, and not really, uh, let, me, I, let me start where, where this began. I, I looked at some research once, it was a meta-analysis 
on uh, and a meta-analysis is a scientific uh, research study of many other scientific research studies. And they found that uh, uh, learning results were virtually uncorrelated with our smile sheet ratings. So in other words, you got high marks on your smile sheets, you could have a very effective course or equally likely um, uh, uh, an ineffective course. If you got low marks on your smile sh sheets, you could have a poorly designed course, but almost equally likely a well-designed course. So clearly, and then there became another meta-analysis saying the same thing, that in the, the correlation for those who um, are statistically inclined was 0.09. So virtually no correlation at all. And uh, you know, when I first saw that, my, my instinct was, oh, we shouldn't use smile sheets because they don't tell us anything meaningful. And then I realized, well, wait a minute, we have been using uh, these smile sheets, these learner surveys for decade after decade after decade. They're a tradition. Uh, and it's also respectful to ask our learners what they really think. So we're not going to get rid of them. Then the question becomes, can we make a better one? And obviously, I wrote a book on this, and my answer was yes. Um, and the book's now in its second edition. The first book was published in 2016. Um, and I had started working on this you know, earlier. Um, so uh, the basic uh, thing about the new approach is that instead of using Likert-like scales or numeric scales, which tend to be fuzzy, they allow bias, they don't support learners in thinking about uh, the learning, um, uh, we're using uh, what I call distinctive questions. So questions that have distinctive answer choices. And uh, just so I uh, give an example from the book, um, this is, uh, there's 50 candidate questions that you can look at and choose from, but here's one of them. Um, how able are you to put what you've learned into practice in your work? Choose the one option that best describes your current readiness. Uh, choice A is my current role does not enable me to use what I learned. Uh, B is I am still unclear about what to do and or why to do it. C is I need more guidance before I know how to use what I learned. Uh, D is I need more experience to be good at using what I learned. E is I can be successful now in using what I learned, even without more guidance or experience. And F is I can perform now at an expert level in using what I learned. So a couple things about that design. Number one, it's about something important on the job performance. And note the granularity, the distinctiveness between the answer choices. We're not having people choose between strongly agree and agree, um, uh, which tends to bore them and you know make them unmotivated. Um, we're having them choose between concrete things. So there's three advantages to that. One, it's more motivating. Um, in the old days, the paper-based smile sheets, you probably saw people circle the same numbers all the way down. Well, that's no good, right? Because they're not thinking, they're not really processing. So number one, the distinctive answer choices give us uh, more motivation from the learners. Uh, two, we're supporting our learners in making decisions. So these concrete answer choices, they can wrap their heads around. They can think, oh, Am I unclear or do I know this? Can I do something now? Um, so that supports their decision making. When they make better decisions, we get better data. And the third reason is that uh, that this distinctive answer choices are so valuable is that the data we get is much more clear. Normally in the old Likert day, uh, we get you know uh, uh, an average. My course is a 4.1. Yeah. Well, what does that mean? If you ever looked at a lot of you know, smile sheet ratings, all the all the numbers are between 3.8 and 4.5. They're all bunched up there. There's no distinction. You don't know what to do. So you either don't do anything or you get paralyzed. Um, now with this uh, new format, we, we can see that, whoa, 40% of our people say that they're unclear about the content or whatever it is. So it, it just, you know, it just gives a lot more clarity to our uh, to our data. And when we have more clarity in our data, we can make better decisions based on that data. So uh, that's in a, in a nutshell. There's a lot more to it. You know, I teach a, a big long workshop on how to put these things together. Um, there's immediate ones. There's later ones. Um, there's you know trying to increase your response rates. There's how to turn these into quantitative data if you need it, et cetera. Uh, but that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And and you know. We've ourselves used uh, some of your surveys now for gathering feedback from our webinar attendees, you know, so that we can get clearer, like you mentioned, clearer data, more actionable 
uh, data. So yeah, very insightful that way, absolutely. And I, <laughs> I chuckled on, you know, uh, people clicking four, 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 four on everything. <laughs> yeah. Right. Correct. Uh... Okay. So, uh, well, tell me, how does this fit into L10 then, the performance focused learner surveys? How that sure. L10 gel together? So, actually, that's a good question because some people get confused and they say, I want to use the L10 survey method. Uh -huh. well, there is no L10 survey method. You know, one guy, me, created both, but they're really separate. Uh, L10 is a learning evaluation framework and uh, performance-focused learner surveys is a way to do surveying. Um, it's the same thing when people say, I use the Kirkpatrick uh, uh, survey methodology. Well, there's not really one of those. So, um, uh, so LTEM would fit into tier three. Mm. Tier three is learner perceptions. Mm -hmm. And one thing I did in LTEM is I separated out, because I think it's helpful, um, the kind of learner survey that asks questions that relate to learning effectiveness versus the kind of questions that relate only to learner satisfaction or reputation of the course. So uh, uh, performance-focused learner surveys fit into tier 3A and traditional smile sheets fit into uh, tier 3B. Excellent. And and and, and just to, just to, you know, uh, add on to that. So you can see that um, learner surveys uh, fit into tier three and there's tier four, five, six ahead of that on learning. And then there's tier seven and eight, which get it transfer and work performance. So one of the things I emphasize over and over in the book is, hey, if you can do more than learner surveys, please do that because you're only getting a sliver of the information you might get if you measured more uh, rigorously. Right, yeah. Yeah, again, to, to me, you know, it's it's the low hanging fruit. You know, if you can make this change, uh, it you can probably take next steps. But yes, very rightly said that it is only one part of your measurement. There are uh, slightly higher levels that you need to go to the other tiers. Yeah, and you know, that's exactly what I tell my clients is, hey, you know, you, you've come to me, you want to do better in learning evaluation. That's great. Um, you might want to think about this as a journey. And mm -hmm. the first place to start uh, is to use a better learner survey. Mm -hmm. If you do that, you're going to have some successes. And that'll give you the uh, political will and the confidence that, you know, you can take it to the next level. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, uh, can we... Uh, measure learning impact i think you've answered it in partially so we can't really measure learning impact with these surveys or can we that's a great question um i once wrote an article it was titled something like the biggest lie in learning evaluation <laughs> and the lie was uh and this was back in the kirkpatrick days so the lie was hey we can measure uh business results with our learner surveys and they're like no you can't <laughs> <laughs> so it's the same thing with with this methodology we can get hints about how well the learning went mm -hmm. um uh, but uh to really measure learning outcomes it's it's much more complex um in my l10 boot camp for example i say okay you know you need to think about um how are you going to make sure that the impacts on the business or the organization or even the behavior how can you make sure that those things were caused by your training mm. you know, what if what if the the economy got better what if uh, you know you your company launched a new product what if new management came in um what if there was some kind of uh, cataclysmic you know earthquake uh, you know that hurt hurt things or whatever, there could be all kinds of other things impacting. So how do you then decide that it's really training? Well, the best method, the gold standard is to use a randomized control trial. Right. So let's say you're gonna, you develop, you're developing a new leadership development program, you know you're gonna take 100 people through it. Um, what you do is you figure out who those 100 people are and then you'd randomly assign first 50 to get this new training and the other 50 get the old training 
or you wait to give them training. And then you, you know, a month after you give the new training, you measure both groups on the, the impact. And you see, and you hope to see that the people that got the new training are doing better than the people that got the old training. But then that's where you can tell that it's really the training and not some other impact. Now, often we can't do that, it's too hard. Um, but there's other ways we could do pre to post, we can do a time series analysis. So look at the results over time. Um, but you have to think about what kind of study design, if you will. And those complexities uh, turn people off. You know, people come to me, Will, we wanna, we wanna do a level four, or we wanna you know, do a, a tier eight or an ROI analysis, can you help? And I say, sure. Um, one thing that I do is I, I sort of insist on a little, I call it an evaluation backgrounder, because I want to help, I want to help organizations uh, make good decisions for themselves. I don't want to say, okay, we're going to do this whole learning evaluation study uh, without really giving them a chance to sort of understand learning evaluation at a deep level. So we do that educational stuff, uh, people wrap their heads around it. So they come to me, they say, well, we want to, uh, we want to measure business results. And then we start talking about, well, okay, we're going to have to do some kind of control group or pre to post. These are the costs and benefits. And then they, they always say to me, well, they don't always, but sometimes they say, hey, well, you know, I guess we really don't want to measure ROI. We really don't want to measure business results because, wow, you really showed us how difficult it is. Um, and we're not even sure our business stakeholders will buy into the results. You know, they're going to think we spent a lot of money for not a lot of gain it's not as easy as you think in our survey. You can't just do it with surveys. So you got to put more into it. Sometimes it's really valuable to do that, but uh, we should know the costs and benefits. Yeah, absolutely. And and while you're talking about the control group and, you know, uh, the training group, uh, if it is a sales training program and what you have to really measure is uh, actually are they selling more, the sales cycles come into picture and that could be three months to six months. So you don't know till about six months, 12 months down the line, whether the training has made any impact. And I don't think the businesses are going to wait for that. <laughs> That's right. And just think of all the other things that could have impacted that between then, you know? So, yeah. Does, does the, the uh, Brinkerhoff success case method work any better in such situations which are long drawn uh, in your experience if you have I ever try to use that? Yeah, Rob's uh, Rob Brinkerhoff's uh, method, I, I teach about it in the L10 Bootcamp. I think it's a really good tool for us to use. Um, uh, for those who don't know, the essence of the method is to uh, do a survey first and find out you know, what are the success cases, wh who did really well in, in implementing the new learning, and also the failure cases, who did not do so well. And then you figure out who they are. And then after that, survey, then you interview them at a more, more depth. Um, so that can be a useful tool, definitely. No one method is like a killer, uh, you know, a killer app that figures out, you know, that solves all our problems. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it is complex. And that's why I think a lot of organizations would have, you know, shied away from it or are focusing their energies on only measuring some of their programs to that extent, because it does take time and energy to that. Yeah. I, I think it's really valuable to do. Um, that's why I say in my book on learner surveys, I don't just do learner surveys. Um, but you got to be, you got to prioritize, you know, maybe you do it only for, um, you know, occasionally once a year, you go really into depth. So you get really good feedback and that helps your learning team, right? Yeah. If you get really good feedback, then your learning team learns from that. And then they build more effective learning interventions. Um, you know, maybe you have a new strategically important program that you want to evaluate at a real high depth. Um, or you do something all the time, like your onboarding program or your leadership development program. Well, those things are high uh, impact, high leverage. So we, you know, maybe we really want to dig deeper on those. Hmm. Also in the book, uh, I really like the idea of uh, stealth messaging with these surveys. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Maybe an example, you know, how a particular uh, question sure. or survey is really sending out that message that you want to send out to whom? Uh, thank you for asking that question because I love talking about stealth messaging. Um, uh, there's actually a story in the book that I'll share. Uh, Ian Blake, really smart guy, worked for a company in Sweden called Tetra Pak, and he wanted to introduce uh, performance-focused learner surveys there. 
And he's a smart guy. He knew that if he just rolled it out, he might get some resistance. Yeah. So what he did was he brought in, he had all these subject matter experts who were doing training and he would bring in a representative sample one at a time into his office um, and show them the learner survey that he was, uh, that he had designed. And so one day uh, he asked this guy to come in and um, the, uh, the took him through the questions and the guy said, oh yeah, that's good. That's good. Oh, that, why do you ask that? Oh, and they had conversation about it. He got to this one question. It was a question about after training follow through. So the question was something like, um, uh, now that you've gone to the program, what kind of after training supports do you expect to get to help you uh, be successful in applying what you've learned? And there's choices like my manager will help me. I'll have a coach, uh, I'll have job aids, et cetera. Um, and uh, what Ian did, he tailored the question. So he changed it a little bit, um, which I do recommend. Um, and he said, uh, he added this one line in there that said, uh, I will be uh, enrolled in my instructor's Yammer group um, so that we'll have further discussions and reinforcement after the training. And uh, this guy got to that question and said, Yammer, ah, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Nobody's going to do that. That's crazy. Take that item out of there. You don't really need it. And uh, so anyway, uh, <laughs> Ian was a little you know, taken back, but he was not defensive. He was a smart guy. And he said, thank you very much. So the guy left the office. Uh, that night, the guy was in the shower and he was thinking about that Yammer idea. And he said, uh, wow, that Yammer, that's a, that's a really good idea. That's brilliant. I'm going to now add Yammer to every one of my courses to reinforce the learning. And so now let's think about that. This learner survey had never been finalized. No learner had ever seen it. No data had ever been collected. And already this question uh, had had an impact on the learning practices in that organization. So the questions we can ask send messages. They help people think about it. Um, you, you might be familiar with the behavioral economic notion of nudging. So that's what we can do. We can use our questions to nudge uh, people, our stakeholders, our learners, our business stakeholders to think about things they might not have thought about. Uh, so our questions, you know, sometimes we think about our survey questions only as gathering data, but they also can help educate. Um, and, and one of the really nice things about this is, you know, sometimes when we're educating people, we're trying to, you know, our, our work in L&D is not always understood. We're trying to educate our stakeholders. And, uh, but, you know, when they hear us talk and they, they filter us out, they think we're trying to persuade them. But if you sort of have these ideas embedded in some processes, then their filters don't rise. And they're like, oh, wow, um, hmm, that's really interesting. Maybe maybe Yammer is a good idea. Very interesting story. I, I now recall, yeah, I was there in the book. Uh, you know, what, one of the things that I thought when I read the book about these uh, stealth messaging was around practice, you know, because practice is often overlooked in training programs and if, l &D teams can have those surveys where they can highlight that the learners will need practice to become more proficient, et cetera. Then the message kind of goes back to the stakeholders more prominently, more loudly. Uh, the challenge that I see with that is, will the stakeholders or the l &D people have to first get approval on the surveys from stakeholders or they just go ahead and run it and then show the results? How have you seen it being implemented in practice? Uh... People do it in different ways. Um, one of the, uh, uh, you know, some people just roll it out and, you know, see what happens. Yeah. Uh, but typically, uh, and I actually wrote an article on this because it's really important. So, you know, we're building a new type of learner survey. Mm. And we might think, well, this is not that important. So we're not going to get a lot of resistance. But, you know, no matter what changes you make, you, you could get resistance. So um, what, I, what I recommend, and I learned this the hard way, is that if you're going to roll out anything new, you do need to think about your stakeholders. You know, it's, it's stakeholder management, change management 101. Think about your stakeholders and maybe educate them. So now um, organizations, when they learn about this issue, sometimes hire me to come in and just give an hour presentation on this. Uh, get, you know, give our, let our business stakeholders know why we're using this new methodology. 
uh, because once people resist, then there's a fight going on, right? Um, they don't want to back down publicly, et cetera. So it's good to sort of educate um, uh, people in advance. I, I wouldn't be, uh, on the other hand, I wouldn't be shy about pushing things to make them better. That's what, you know, that's what professionals do. Um, and it helps us because we get better data. One of the things that happens in the learning and development field is we feel some frustration, right? Um, I was talking I was talking to a woman last fall and I was sort of doing a listening tour, trying to find out what was going on in the field. And, uh, you know, she, she was a senior L&D person and she'd been doing good stuff. She'd been pushing for, you know, research-based practices. She'd been encouraging uh, the use of better learning evaluation methods, et cetera. And she had a bunch of people now that were aligned with this. And uh, But she just said, this is so hard. I've been fighting this battles for so long. And then some senior business business person comes in and says, ah, whatever, why are you doing that, that? And she just said, you know, I just wish I could bring more joy back into my work. So, <laughs> you know, uh, we don't have simple solutions for that. But one, one solution is to, you know, uh, be innovative where you can. Try things out. See what you can do. Find the uh, early adopters. Find people who are aligned with you. People who you know uh, want to do good things, want to try things. Um, usually, when you do that, it's okay. Um, you know, unless you're in a very toxic environment, um, you can try some experiments. People admire that, um, and then you find out results, and then you go from there. Um, and and it's inspiring. People feel like, hey, I've made a difference. My work is important. So uh, uh, I, I wouldn't be too shy about pushing forward a mm. little bit. Have you been collecting stories from people who've tried this, uh, you know, after reading the book? Um, I sort of have them in my mind. I don't have, I, I sh probably should, uh, you know, write a, a follow-up book with all the stories. Yeah, or um, on your website somewhere, if you start adding them, I think it will give a lot of confidence to people to say, oh, this is how they did it, this is how they did it. Even if it has yeah. a bit anonymous, you know, but yeah. giving them... Uh, more use cases to work with. Yeah, that's a good idea. I do like the the article I mentioned. Um, it's uh it's on LinkedIn. I'll I'll give you the link. You can share with your uh, listeners okay. uh, later. But uh, I did share several stories in there um, about you know some of the lessons that I learned. Um, I kicked myself for not warning one of my clients to make sure that they uh, educated their stakeholders. So there's there's a lot of that. <laughs> All right. So you have what, 50, 100 different surveys or questions in the book? Uh... I think there's about 50 candidate questions. Um, but one of the things I do in the book is I want people to think, um, you know, uh, thoughtfully about these. So some of the questions I recommend, well, I want, some of the questions I offer I then put, hey, you know, this question should only be used if this situation. Um, so what, I'll give you an example. So uh, NPS, the net promoter score is a big, you know, uh, a, a lot of us in training get pushed, hey, net promoter score, we're using it in marketing. Let's use it for training too. Um, and so I don't recommend the net promoter score. It's really just a, it, it's like one of our old traditional smile sheet questions. It's focused on course reputation. It's got a numeric scale, zero to 10. So it's fuzzy. There's lots of problems with it, but sometimes people have to use it. So I say, okay, well, um, okay. So uh, if, you, if you have to use the NPS scale, first try to push back and try to use my NPS replacement question, which focuses people to think about the effectiveness of the course. And whether you well, and if you can't do that, you know, use the NPS, but put it at the end of the survey after you ask earlier questions that get the learners thinking um, in appropriate ways about the learning. They'll have a better way to assess the overall program. Um, so some of those candidate questions uh, are like, you know, uh, you know, just they're fantastic. There's no problem with it ever. Some of them I say, well, use them here. They're there. And some of the questions I say, well, don't use this except in rare circumstances. Excellent. Yeah, I, I also get this question about net promoter score quite often. And yeah, we try to tell our clients not to use it. Uh, 
And recently I spoke to someone and I told them that if you're selling training to someone and you want net promoter score from a buying audience, maybe you can, because then you can yeah. see right. a paying audience is saying, yeah, I want to recommend this to someone. Yeah, I, I, that's one of the that's one of the ways that it makes sense, right? I know you you've probably talked about this earlier in some other places about neuroscience. But yeah, is there anything from neuroscience that L and D people should be really uh, taking in into their design practices, or most of it is really a lot of marketing buzz? Well, it's a lot of marketing. Um, Although now with generative AI, sort of the neuroscience fad has dissipated a bit. Um, look, first of all, neuroscience is a powerful field. They're uncovering new things all the time. Uh, I, a few years ago, got interested about this. And I went and I, um, I found what the neuroscientists themselves said about their work as it relates to learning. And most of them said, you know, uh, neuroscience by itself is not going to bring a lot of wisdom to learning practice. Um, you know, neuroscience, you're getting down and you're looking at, you know, how the neurons are functioning and it's really a biological uh, science. Um, you really have to pair it with the learning sciences. So, um, uh, I, you know, most of the time, um, you know, we, we know already the kind of good things we should be doing. So we know that the spacing effect helps people remember over a long time. So that's repeating uh, uh, content or ideas over time, not in a rote way, but in an interesting way. Um, that really helps people. We know that retrieval practice is really valuable, helping people um, retrieve information from memory. That's what they we want them to do on the job. So giving them practice in that, you know, aligning the performance context with the learning context, you know, simulating, we know that's good. So those things we know before um, neuroscience. Now, neuroscience looks at those things too and finds out, oh, this is, this, is the, this is the impact in the brain. This is what happens in the brain when these things are working. So it's, it's, you know, it's, a, good, it's a good science, but um, uh, there's a lot of hype out there. People call things neuroscience that really aren't neuroscience. So uh, I, I, I would have a healthy skepticism about it, knowing also that in the future, we are going to learn some things uh, from neuroscience to get us thinking about um, uh, uh, our, our practice. But right now, it doesn't tell us much more than the regular research that's out there. Okay. Uh, tell us something about your new book, if you can give us. What is it about? Uh, what are you trying to give us in the sure. new book? <laughs> so the new book, I've been working on it about five years. Um, it's basically done now. I'll be publishing it in about a month. Um, I'm going to have a Kickstarter campaign. I don't know when this episode will come out, but uh, it'll be running in the um, last part of February, early March, where you'll be able to get discounts on the book, et cetera. Um, the title of the book is The CEO's Guide to Training, E-Learning, and Work, Empowering Learning for a Competitive Advantage. And uh, the, the idea, the basic idea behind the book is that, um, you know, we in L&D are doing good work, um, but we feel frustrated. We want to be empowered. We want to be um, able to do uh, even better work. And one of our roadblocks is how the, uh, our, our business stakeholders, our organization, organizational stakeholders see us. Um, and one of our one uh, the other thing that holds us back is sometimes we don't empower ourselves. So this is a book I, I've written it as if I'm writing to a CEO, and I tell the CEO I say, hey, there's a whole bunch of research on training. Um, you know what it shows? What well, actually shows that training is effective. Mm. Um, not only that, but your L and D teams uh, there's research to show that they've even got more effective over the last ten years or so. So there's always a progression. That's great. Um, and I also say, hey, but there's all this learning science out there that shows ways we can be even more effective. Mm -hmm. uh, things that I mentioned, like the spacing effect, retrieval practice, et cetera. You know, if your learning teams focused a little bit more on that, they could be even more effective, like maybe even doubling their results. Um, I talk about the performance sciences in there. This is a new opportunity. 
Um, this is an opportunity that maybe not many learning teams are using right now. So it's a great way for your company, if you embrace this, if your learning team is able to embrace this, to get a competitive advantage. Um, I talk, you know, I tell the CEOs, hey, I got some bad news for you. The data we as in L and D that we give to you uh, to show that we're doing well, that data is, and I, I very straightforward, I call it crap data. And I say, you know, oh, it's not good. It's not good enough. Yeah. You know, we're telling you we have certain number of completion rates, and we tell you our, you know, using traditional smile sheets that doesn't tell us much. Um, and so, you know, I talk about uh, learning evaluation as being one of the big problems in in our space. And I I say to the CEOs, hey, fund this more. You know, let your team do this. Don't let them focus only on business results. That's not good enough. Have them focus on the learning factors because that's where they get the leverage to build more effective learning. And if, you're, if your learning is much more effective than your competitors, you're going to have a competitive advantage. So I go into lots of things. I talk about uh, like uh, uh, workflow learning. Mm -hmm. I talk about generative AI. Mm -hmm. um, I talk about uh, you know, how do you know your learning leader is doing a good job? You know, these are the things you should look for. I say, I say to the CEOs, hey, this is what your organization should probably invest more in. This is probably what you should invest less in. Um, there's 50 chapters to the book. Most of them are short, like two pages long. Okay. I want it to be really, you know, uh, concise, hard hitting. But then there's chapter notes. Uh, there's like 90 pages of chapter notes or something like that with a whole bunch of research behind it for people who really want to dig deeper. Uh, but most of the time, not all the chapters are two pages, um, but a lot of them are because I want to make really clear messaging um, that CEOs can take away from that. And, and it's not just for CEOs. Um, it seems as if it is, but there's really two audiences. One is people in the C-suite, our senior leaders, but also us as learning professionals, our chief learning officers, um, our other senior leaders in the L&D space. I mean, any really learning practitioners will get um, an incredible benefit out of this to think about you know, what are our major leverage points? Where is the field headed? Because um, I include a lot of things in there about, um, about the future, you know, about the performance sciences and using those, about, um, you know, thinking about how the work performance context triggers people to think certain ways and how we could leverage that to go beyond training. Um, I'm very excited about the book mm. and uh, I can't wait to uh, get it out to, to the public. Um, if people are interested in in it or want to sign up to be notified when it's actually published, they can go to uh, ceosguide.net, ceosguide.net. Excellent. I'm excited too. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. Excellent. Excellent. So it's been a wonderful conversation, Will. But finally, before I let you go, if organizations want your help with learning surveys, learning design, evaluation, anything, how could they get in touch and learn more about you? Well, I have a website. Uh, it's worklearning.com. So work, um, what you and I are doing right now in it, and learning, uh, what we training folks create, or what kids do in school, worklearning.com. Excellent. Excellent. Wonderful, Will. Thank you so much for your time today. Very insightful. Uh, thanks a bit for inviting me, and thanks... Uh, for having a great conversation. This was awesome. Fantastic.